When I was uh, told to uh, consider uh, speaking about subjectivity, the subject question and subjectivity, uh, the possible approaches to it that comes to us are twofold. One is the absence of it in social science, not humanities so much, but in social science research generally. The absence of it in natural science work, definitely. The absence of it in technology uh, kind of studies. Uh, and the presence of it in some of social science, some of humanities. So uh, that is where I have, I, actually uh, the slides are for the students. They are not so much needed for faculty. I could have just spoken, but I thought let me put it up so that we, they get included, they don't feel left out. Uh, on the one hand, uh, whenever one is, one is trying to approach the question of uh, subjectivity, uh, subject, subjectivity, we'll, we'll see the difference also slowly. Um, one is dealing with a twofold problem. On the one hand, there is, a, there is an absence, the absence of it, which needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, that's not a turn we would like to take. On the other hand, there is a presence of it, but the presence is sometimes very simple. So you, you, you turn to subjectivity, but the turn to subjectivity or to the subject question is a somewhat simple turn. We, we need to work further on it to, to understand uh, where, where it could go hereafter. And I thought I'll uh, go through about uh, six, seven, seven and a half possible turns in thinking around subjectivity and see what is the what is first absence, then see what is the original understanding of subjectivity and how we would like to work on it further, and then see whether uh, we could we could think of something uh, interesting over there. So uh, this is the plan of the talk. So uh, I would start with first the problem of absence, and that is my one. So. Uh, that is, uh, <coughs> modernity entered India riding piggyback on Euclidean Italianism, British empiricism and Baconian science, also positivist Marxism, and all three traditions of knowledge had a clear touch of suspicion, sorry, uh, uh, if not fear of the subjective and an almost phobic reaction to the inner life of citizens. So this is, this is uh, a quote from uh, the controversial Ashish Nandi. Um, and uh, he suggests in one of his, one of his actually last books, um, uh, the fear of the subjective and the phobic reaction to the inner life of citizens. So, so there is an absence. Of, of a turn to subjectivity, we, we, are, we are not taking that turn, we are comfortable with numbers, we are comfortable with data, but uh, the turn to the subjective is something that makes us anxious. So uh, this is one. The second, uh, in one sense the expropriation of experience, and this will be taken up tomorrow, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm just using it to enter subjectivity today. The expropriation of experience was implicit in the founding project of modern science. Modern science has its origins in an unprecedented mistrust of experience as it was traditionally understood. Uh, Bacon defines it as a forest and a maze which has to be put in order. Uh, the view through Galileo's telescope produced not certainty and faith in experience, but Descartes' doubt and his famous hypothesis of a demon whose only preoccupation is to deceive our senses. So, so uh, these are the two, two uh, uh, propositions I'm using uh, to show that there is a fear of the subjective it is seen as demonic experience and the turn to experience, turn to the perhaps the uncanny of experience. Experience we can deal with up to a point, but 
the uncanny of experience becomes something that is difficult. And, I, and I'll come to what is uncanny. What is uncanny experience? And, and, and what is it that, that makes us phobic? What is it that makes us anxious? Uh, and, and, it's, and it's not easy to enter, enter that domain. Uh, but these are the two, uh, one by Nandi uh, back home and one by Agamem who is, who is uh, uh, further away from us. But both uh, kind of raising uh, opposite concerns that uh, there is a fear, fear of the subject. There is a fear of, 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 of uh, experience also which uh, will be taken up tomorrow. So, uh, I won't get into experience today. And these two create uh, a premise for me from where uh, one uh, can enter the second part, okay, uh, now into presence. Now how the subject question or the subjectivity question has been with us. So, uh, premise one was the absence question, where it is not there in primarily the social sciences. And how is it not there? Why is it not there? Why do we think it is not there? Two, how it is there, the nature of it, when it is there. So, that is, that is the second. So, I have dealt with absence a little bit. The absence question can be opened up further. Um, in terms of the presence of subjectivity, actually. So now I'll get into areas where subjectivity is present and yet absent. So uh, this is the premise I've set up. Premise one, there is a clear absence, clear fear of the subjective. Now premise two, there is presence. There is presence of it, but it's present in a certain manner. And what do we do with that? How do we how do we respond to that? To that presence, to that kind of a presence. When we discuss subjectivity, one of the domains one will have to uh, somewhat relate to, and you cannot wish it away, is objectivity or objectivism. <coughs> or how natural science deals with the question of subjectivity. And uh, one of my favorite examples, I used it before, uh, but always in a science institution, not an institution like this, uh, maybe the Indian Institute of Science, where I would ask, uh, say for example, uh, the person seated beside you says he or she is feeling feverish. Uh, how do you know uh, whether the person is indeed having fever? And the immediate response is, yes, I would use a thermometer and I would get to know uh, what, is, what is the rise of temperature, what is the rise of body temperature in the person. I would, I would get to know. Only later as you probe, as you go ahead and uh, as you, as you ask, uh, how did we do it before we had the thermometer? The usual understanding is that we have the thermometer. But human cultures have had the thermometer only in the last uh, couple of hundred years. So how did we do it? So then they would say, oh, I would observe, I would see whether there is redness of eye. I would maybe... Uh, put my palm on the forehead of the person and try to understand and see whether the person, uh, whether there is indeed a rise of body temperature or I would ask the person and, and all kinds of possibilities will then open up and then I would ask how would you express and then the point would come, yes I would express it through language yes, and, and language has an interesting repository of terms and expressions which would tell us, yes, uh, the person has fever, has high fever, has low fever, and I can do it in Bengali language, I can give you about 20, 25 terms, which are actually gradations of fever. So it's not that it has to be only rising Fahrenheit that will give us 
a sense uh, of rights of body temperature. But human cultures, human activities have had long relations with rights of body temperature. And the grandmother could find out uh, whether, whether the grandchild should go to school or not go to school, uh, depending on whether he or she had fever or not had fever. So in that sense, uh, there is no reason to believe that the thermometer is the only way. But it's a very interesting apparatus, the thermometer. It gives us a sense of certainty and truth uh, that is, that is uh, quite fundamental. And I have chosen a thermometer, not a blood pressure instrument, to uh, set, up, uh, set up this example. Because the thermometer, and this is the belief in objectivity or what I am calling objectivism, or, or determinism that natural science arrives at that, yes, the thermometer will record the temperature and now see what an interesting apparatus it is. The thermometer has a thing and this rise of the mercury column will not be disturbed if it is not brought down, which is exactly what we do by human action. We, we uh, we bring uh, the mercury column down below the king, and the king retains that column. And it's a very interesting apparatus. Even if the doctor, the nurse is not there, even if the patient is not there, the rise of temperature can be retained. And it can be retained for, metaphorically put, a million years actually. And one can say, oh, on that day, in 2013, the rise of temperature was this, it was 102 degrees Fahrenheit. It is, it, is, it is such an apparatus. And this gives natural science a framework, a feeling that yes, we can do it, we can organize things in this manner, and we can know things with certainty to a near exclusion of the human angle. That even if the suffering subject and the measuring subject pull out, the record of temperature rise will be made, will remain forever. And it is such a certain and objective measure. On the other hand, the other two examples when you have to ask the person whether he or she has fever and the uh, intersubjective experience where you maybe two human surfaces come to touch each other and, and uh, take touch seriously over here that when two human surfaces come to touch each other they give us a feeling that yes there is rise, there is no rise etc. and they come to a kind of mediated consensus yes there is something. So in that sense the, the second and third require the human subjects to be present in some form or the other. The first as if does not require it. It gives us a feeling it is not required. We can work without human presence. And, and in the second and third, the, the, the human presence is, is required. However, see very interestingly, in the third and the second, the element of doubt can be introduced. That the person who is saying, I have fever, and who are you to tell me I don't have? Okay. Or you take it further, I am in pain, who are you to tell me I am not in pain, this is my loss, this is my trauma, is a position the subject takes. And you can always have um, a, a discussion on that, a deliberation on that, a critique of that, and all kinds of things can be opened up. The element of, of skepticism or doubt comes in in the third. It comes in significantly when the claimant to pain, and, and this, is, this is one issue uh, Wittgenstein takes up in his work on philosophy of pain, that how will we know pain? How will we know that the other is in pain? And I'll get into interesting, actually, new kinds of um, mm, brain studies findings, which are actually making us rethink the question of pain. And, and uh, uh, this, is, this is the question which is trying to ask that uh, how do I know that the other person is in pain? What, what would be the process? process? And, and here the understanding is that uh, uh, the, the, the 
person who is making a claim um, can be uh, can be doubted, can be questioned, and 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 uh, say a courtroom is a very good experience uh, straddling one, two, three. So uh, legal legal evidence, legal work requires a relationship between one, two, and three. And, 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 and it is always difficult to really, really mark a point over there like the thermometer. There is a, there is a difficulty. So, so you can doubt somebody's experience or somebody's uh, uh, subject position, the position one takes. The, the mediated two, the two where the two are coming to a consensus can also be doubted. And, and, that is for for the researchers in this room, the young researchers. That is what comes up when we are talking about, say, ethnography, taking interviews, participant observation, and all kinds of social science processes, which are intersubjective tools. And and that intersubjective tool can always be questioned, can always be uh, put to doubt, and and all kinds of things can happen. Take it a little further, the natural science example. And, and it helps us also see what we are as social sciences or as humanities. What is the domain? Where we are? What are we? Now take, and I, and I say pain, uh, how do I know I'm in pain? What is my pain? Now take it a little further. Think of a glass beaker and a pen dipped in the beaker. Look from outside, the pen will look bent. And as soon as I ask it to ISC scientists, they say, yes, I know the pen is straight. I'll just take the pen out and, and show the world that the pen is straight. However, from a position when you see the pen in water, you see the pen bent. And these are two dispositions that haunt the sciences, not just social sciences. On the one hand, the approach is to take the pen out and tell the world that the pen is straight. The other is to take the bent pen seriously. Take the bend of the pen seriously. And each pain, and I have slipped into pain now, P A I N, it's not P E N anymore. Each pain is bent differently. One approach would be to take the pain out and have an objective measure of it, which is the natural science measure. The other is to take the pain as bent, and all subjects, a mad statement made by Lacan. All subjects are neurotic. Now, what is that? Uh, it doesn't matter whether we are or not. Uh, but what is important is that all of us are bent pens, bent in different ways. And that is the interesting challenge of subjectivity. On the one hand, you can normativize, normalize the understanding of the pen or the pain, the understanding of the subject if it can now stand for pen and pain, that you can, you can non-activize it and say, yes, it's a straight pen. The subject is straight, which is why see, in, in humanities and social science work, and from now on call it human sciences, then uh, I say thank uh, Human sciences stand for me as the uh, constellation of humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences, which are closer. Uh, uh, medicine is an interesting uh, model of uh, natural science, human science interface. It's at the cusp. It's not fully natural science. Psychiatry is more tilted towards the human sciences. So, but, but uh, uh, not psychiatry so much, but uh, kinds of psychology and psychoanalysis would be tilted towards the human sciences more. Uh, so, in, in that sense, Taking all, all subjects as bent, which is why we say subjectivities. It's not only 
it's all, not only a fashion to put an S before everything nowadays. Uh, uh, it, it, is, it is a serious point actually to put that S, that you don't have that one normative singular subject. You don't have a philosophy of the one, O N E. My O is in caps lock. Okay? I don't have a philosophy of the one to rely upon, a philosophy of identity to rely upon, a philosophy of identity with I in caps lock. Okay? Uh, a, a kind of identitarian metaphysics. I don't have that. Okay? Once that is not available, and, and mark the distinction between the straight pen and the bent pen, the straight subject, the subject that gets straightened again and again, or is told to respond to a straightening. It's told to respond to a straightening, a straight framework, okay. as against subjects that are bent or queer, as against subjects that are subjectivities, and a queer in interesting ways. Each one is a queer. Each one of us are queer, and, and because we work within a psychoanalytic frame, it comes to us every day in the clinic that we are all queer. Uh, we are all queer in very, very beautiful and interesting ways. And, and uh, a turn to subjectivity is a turn to setting up a relation with our queerness, with our inalienable queerness. A queerness that cannot be wished away. Least. The straight pen framework creates a structure, and and I am slipping into resistance politics center margin uh, uh, for a minute. I'll, I'll, I I I I won't get too much into it, but but see the distinction uh, for research that gets marked in terms of a straight subject framework and a bent subjectivity framework. These two frameworks create two different social sciences or human sciences for us. On the one hand, if you have a framework of the straight subject, a subject straightened by modernity, perhaps, a subject straightened by the sciences in the 18th century, you will always have an underbelly as against the straight, which would come as the lacking other. So you would have a framework developed and you will have then a group of societies, cultures and subjects who would not have a self-definition but would be called underdeveloped or undeveloped. And they would always be measured in terms of the parameter, the straight subject, the scale, the caliber that has been set. So one framework is a framework where you have a standard, I'm calling it P, and a lacking standard, lacking in terms of that standard, I'm calling them varieties or trajectories of not P, which is how we divided the world into developed and underdeveloped. And, and the whole philosophy of underdevelopment is premised by this framework of a straight subject a developed subject where we have pre-decided what is developed, what it is to be developed. And on the other hand, we will then have all dwarfed or handicapped cohorts of that straight subject. And they would be different brands lacking, lacking P's, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P infinity. We will have varieties and brands of lacking P. India is less lacking, Africa is more lacking, Latin America is between India and Africa. So we'll all have gradations and scales. We will all have human subjects seen in terms of a scale. The framework, and, and this comes from actually Aristotle's two value logic, where he where he says that we, we have either P or not P. The world is divided between P and not P. There is nothing in between. And this, this is the third law of, of uh, his logic, which is called law of excluded unity. That's a very interesting concept, actually. 
the the world is divided between p and not p and you see how contemporary framework are determined by this logic even work in the human sciences are determined by this logic even economics sometimes clearly determined by this logic that you have a framework for p and a not p and that exhausts the world the third law is the most interesting uh, first is law of identity second is law of contradiction those two are not so important for us today the the uh, the third is most important law of excluded middle that there is nothing in between p and not p p and not p exhaust the world the possibilities of the world and that is how the framework of development or of identity works that you have a straight framework who is an indian and you have a framework for the indian and then you have all the latin indians non indians and all kinds of subjects thereafter to be in the right so so you will you will always have a, a framework where you will have a standard and the non standards thereafter the 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 law of excluded middle doesn't allow the insertion of a third possibility over here it exhausts the world in terms of truth it doesn't allow a third inside it and interestingly this world of two is not a world of two it is a world of the one there is no two the two is a lacking one the two is a dwarf one in that sense there is no philosophy of the two there is only a philosophy of the one and that is one way of looking at subjectivity which is my present sarkum you can look at subjectivity but you reduce it to an identitarian metaphysics the developed the indian or some such project on the other hand you can have a framework where you insert the third the fourth the fifth the sixth into the framework of the two and the framework opens up you 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 tap the framework and 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 it's pulled open and you have then what is called subjective you can not simply run to subjectivity in terms of plurality subjectivities are not plural because there are many subjectivities subjectivities are plural because we are moving from a philosophy of one subjectivity is reduced to a standard to a philosophy of the not one i am not calling it many i am not calling it two i am calling it the philosophy of the not one where an opening is created into a framework that has only one and these frameworks historically i'm doing it very quickly each one can be looked into it very very carefully these frameworks for example one very important framework generated in the 18th century and this is a work by michel foucault's student uh, thomas lacker where uh, the suggestion is that uh, how the two sex model uh, a secure two sex model the male and the female was imagined and generated which looks very obvious among us yes there are two sexes what is the problem we all know it our experience tells us there are two sexes uh, and 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 uh, which is why which is why uh, i think tomorrow this will be taken up we need to we need to reflect on what is experience and i'm glad we are we are moving to experience from subjectivity um, so uh, 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 a common sense gets generated yes there are two sexes and thomas lacker raises a simple question and see how the question opens up so much so much for us if men and women are the opposite sex and that's how we were taught in school no? we have two sexes men and women like travels in straight line and leaves are green okay i'll problematize all three uh uh and and we these three these three things we learned in school uh if men and women are the opposite sexes what then is the neighboring sex 
See, a framework has been created which has a framework of two and the framework is opposition. And in that framework, you are supposed to imagine sexuation. Our sexing. Our, our experiences as sex subjects. Whereas analytic work shows us that there are no two sexes. There are a million neighboring sexes. Bodies are not experienced in terms of either what six packs tell us or fashion TV tells us. Bodies are experienced in uncanny ways, in extremely interesting and aesthetically charged ways. And, and, and uh, this will take me to my last problem, actually. Uh, I'm just flagging the problem. Uh, there is no such thing as a sexual relationship. How did I say that? There is no such thing as a sexual relationship. So I have to prove how I am saying this. Huh? Why am I saying this? That there is no such thing as a sexual relationship. Huh? There is no such thing because bodies and sexes are experienced in very, very interesting ways. They are not experienced in either what I am calling objectivism or 18th, early 19th century determinisms, which gave us two sexes, men and women. Men and women are the opposite sex. Interestingly in that, what we did also was a secret and occult philosophy of one, that the woman came to be seen as a Latin standard, as a Latin man, as a man lacking in a felicism that Freud thought was the attribute of human sex objectivity, okay, which is why feminist critiques of Freud's phallocentrism are important. Well, what, is, what is the critique? The critique is that the framework is set up in terms of a philosophy of one or a philosophy of P and not. As against which you have a philosophy of not one where the sexes emerge as neighboring. And that is queer. That is an experience of bent parents. That is an experience of bent subjects, how we, how we uh, live ourselves in a, in a certain way. Now these subjects, as, as they go about, and I'll go through these one by one. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the first one is uh, uh, objectivism, determinism. I think I have shared with you now uh, what is an objective uh, framework. And uh, objective frameworks of subjectivity can also be operated, which is the usual way of numericalizing subjectivities or tending to understand subjectivities as identity has given identities with identity parameters and not allowing a flow in them. And, and that, that is one way of doing it. So, so you can interestingly have uh, objectivist, determinist understandings of subjectivity. Okay. And, and we'll see uh, how it can go on uh, uh, deeper. Here there is one interesting distinction that needs to be marked and it, it Inflects, maybe I'll take it up in the afternoon, it's more important for researchers, not for, not for colleagues who are teachers, uh, is the distinction between subjectivity in philosophy and subjectivity in politics. And that is a, that is a distinction that we can take up in the afternoon. Uh, but but in, in, in some kinds of understandings of subjectivity, the question of freedom, free will, etc. comes in. Okay. So when we are presenting subjectivity, and this is the next one I'm getting into, so, so uh, uh, as we try to attend to subjectivity, our tendency is to see subjectivity in human freedom or free will. And that is one domain where we tend to locate subjectivity. Oh, it's here. It's here. Rest of the world is determined. The natural world is ruled by what Newton called laws of nature, as it is laws of God. Okay. Not much of a, not much of a shift. Uh, uh, you 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 have laws of nature, which are ruling us. But human freedom, human free will is one domain where we will get a glimpse of the subject. So 
So the, the question of the subjective becomes a question of whether and where we will glimpse it. We'll get a glimpse of it. That's that. The other framework that becomes uh, possible over here is that the subjective is given to the mind, to the mental, to the theater of the mental. And the Cartesian theater is that interesting distinction where as if the body is a determinate res extensa, which is there for the doctor to dissect and open, okay, and is objectively available to us. And one interesting question I always like to ask natural science uh, students, how many bodies do we have? And they always think we have only one body, the body that is available to objective determinations, the body that has what Foucault calls in birth of the clinic three-dimensional tissue space, the anatomoclinical body. The body can be opened up in terms of organs. So body is a constellation of organs. Body is a geography of spaces. So the body is like the world map. In the world map, the world, what is the world? The world is a sphere in rotation. There are no maps. Uh, maps are uh, uh, what human uh, interventions uh, into a sphere in rotation. That's that's how that's how map making or meaning making happens. Uh, and and the body also is seen as a geography of spaces in natural science. So the body is out there, and, and the body is outside of us, and the body is a constellation of spaces. It's a geography of organs. Geography of tissues, and and that is how the body is seen. And and uh, interestingly, uh, uh, an objectivist understanding of the body on one side, uh, which is why uh, feminist work has had to talk about lived bodies. Again, the premise of lived experience, but lived bodies, bodies as lived. <coughs> as against bodies as anatom clinically given. So as against given bodies, bodies as lived. But natural science tries to put the body into the bodies as given and allows sometimes the mind or the mental as the domain of the subject. But what is the mind or the mental? What is freedom? What is free will? Where is it? It moved thereafter. So as we move from Descartes to Kant, uh, uh, subjectivity for Kant becomes, and I'm referring to one piece by him, what is enlightenment? Where he defines enlightenment, if some of you have read it among our research friends, uh, that uh, it, it, is a, it is a movement from a self-imposed immaturity. So it is, it, is, it is humanity's movement from a self-imposed immaturity and an actualizing of, for want of time, and putting it as critical reason. And an actualizing of critical reason from a self-imposed immaturity. And that becomes the understanding of the human subject. The human subject from now on, hereafter, will be the subject who would manage to make this movement from immaturity to critical reason, to what we call critical faculties. The, the term faculty, we are all faculty. <laughs> uh, we are supposed to exercise this, uh, which, which eludes us most of the time, but uh, 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 that, that is how he understands, he understands the subject. Descartes understands the subject differently. He understands the subject in terms of that coordinate of thought. I am because I think, but think what? I can think, I can reflect on my dreams. Many things, but I'm taking only meditations too, uh, which is a reflection on dreams. And you know, that is where I end. I end with dreams huh? um, and, and see where it goes. The next two steps, rationalism, empiricism, I'll keep it simple for my young friends over here. Um, uh, 
think of a spider who can spin a web from within. Does not require the help of anything outside. And think of a bird or an ant who creates the nest from inputs that come from the outside world. The simple distinction between rationalism and empiricism, which are big sounding words, is just this. <laughs> that a human subject has a rational mental apparatus and can relate to the world in terms of that, can spin a web like a spider. The other is we are a tabula rasa. Experience gives us what we would perhaps come to have as ourselves. And that leads to a kind of subject formation. So you, you begin with childhood, with infancy, with experience, and you move. And, and uh, these two frameworks, one a more French framework, where the understanding is that there is something determinant, determinant in us in terms of rationality. And on the other hand, the understanding that it is gathered, it is introjected into us with experience. And which way you will think subjectivity is a question. And, and these frameworks then, then come to inform. So I have now done two or two, three. Uh, two was the natural science framework, which I am giving up and, and trying to move uh, towards a framework within the human sciences where we indeed attend to subjectivity, but the attention as against objectivism and determinism in natural science comes through frameworks that either are mental, and then we have to define what is mental, or freedom, free will, but that is something we'll have to again understand and define, or critical reason, or a more structural, topographical understanding of subjectivity where we think we either have it or we we'll get it, or we'll be a combination of both. Okay. Which is the uh, both model that yes, there is something and uh, uh, something will also get added, which is interestingly calm, calm in critic of, critic of pure reason, where he sets up, if I may put it this way, a little, little reductionist maybe, a philosophy of the both, uh, where, where he suggests that uh, we have both and, and we have to work with both. The last is discourse, I'll come to it last. Uh, I have done this, the absence, I have done this as the absence. I will now come to an essay. Uh, it's, it's called eating well, it doesn't matter what it is called. Uh, it, is, it is more, it, 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 it's a deceptive, it's a deceptive uh, title. By, by the, uh, the, the, the piece is on the calculation of the subject and, and, and the question of, of the subject in a predetermined, predicated calculus and a, and a subject beyond, outside, excessive to a predicated calculus which is something I've set up also in terms of the philosophy of the one and the philosophy of the not one. That, that you, you, you are looking at subjectivity, now we want to look at subjectivity, but subjectivity, the turn to subjectivity, okay, can again happen in terms of a predicated calculus where you have a clear framework, a standard, or you can have a turn to subjectivity in terms of a calculus that is haunted by the uncanny. And uncanny is unfamiliar and familiar, both. And this is the famous Freud piece on the uncanny, where it shows that the uncanny carries two meanings, both familiar and unfamiliar. Okay, so it's a relationship with the familiar and the unfamiliar. And, and, and this, this opens up for us uh, one way of approaching uh, the question of subjectivity, and this is where I will get into now. Let me see how much I have done. Uh, okay. Okay. 
This is my four. So I've done one absence, two presence or absence in natural science, where subjectivity gets reduced to a very thin understanding of subjectivity. Subjectivity is thin. And which is why where um, like uh, just uh, a footnote over here. Uh, we are presently working on a, on a project called uh, the experience of uh, gender violence. Uh, and we have put a colon after that, as is usual these days, uh, developing psychobiologies. Uh, in this project, we, uh, we have, and it's, and it's completely unscientific. Uh, we don't have a sample. We don't have a sample size. We don't have a sample of 30. Uh, 30 will make it knowledge. Uh, we have only 8 subjects. And of the 8, one is not available. And these are subjects who have volunteered to talk to us. And our premise to ICSSR and big people at ICSSR took a look at our project. Perhaps they were very angry with us also. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, what we have done is that we have, we have raised two questions. <laughs> One, violence is not a question of numbers. It is definitely a question of numbers, but not, not only a question of numbers. Two, <coughs> gendering is not a simple experience of malehood and female. Gendering is uncanny. The story of gendering needs to be told. Three, can we think of violence, gender violence, beyond man the perpetrator, woman the victim, as a determinate frame? Or do we need to go back to that frame? This is an open question. Whatever comes, we'll go by it. Four, Violence in terms of numbers raises a question for us. How many killed will qualify as genocide? One, two, hundred, four hundred, one million. How many do I have to kill to say this is violence, this is genocide? <coughs> so how can we have an experience of violence? in its intimate implications with gendering. And the, and the research question was that, can we think of violence without gender? The corollary is, can we think of gendering without violence? Is there any gendering without violence? So, these were opened up as questions. And because 1612, 2012 is on our minds. We also had a question over there, and it was opened up by one of our friends, four of us came together to set up the project. Is rape sexual violence, or is it violence sex? That opened up one more question for us, which we kept open uh, in, 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 the, in the project. Uh, what is the relationship between sexual violence and violent sex. And what we did was that we actually we were we were fortunate enough to find seven volunteers who said yes we want to participate in this project. We want to share our experience with you. The 
discussions went on, and we, we have uh, recordings of the entire discussion, of the entire process. Our recordings have run into between uh, 40 and 80 hours with each subject. So we have, and, and we have not, not asked them any questions. We have not said speak on violence. They have started generally in the free associative mode from childhood, from something in college, from the first sexual experience, from the first experience of violence, and they have moved on in a, in a, in a, in a, in a free-flowing, tortuous, free associative, um, undetermined way. And certain ideas have come. And here we were animated by one narrative that was recorded in a court where it was found that there was a woman. She had been sexually violated, raped, but she did not have marks of quote unquote resistance on her body, which is the usual way and a completely wrong way, of course, uh, by which medicine and law tries to understand sexual violence. And she, as she is losing the case, losing her premise because there are no marks of resistance on her body, she opens up her narrative and says, I'm nearly putting her right. As my clothes were being torn off, I felt raped. Once I had lost all my clothes, I did not feel the need to resist anymore. What I thought was an attack on my dignity had already happened. So in that sense, this subjectivity, this bent stick has a definition of rape, determined by perhaps her experience, her being in the world, and her knowledge of the world, and how she relates to life. So what we did was that we opened up this discussion, and it went into, some, some have uh, gone into seven, between 70 and 80 hours when we had to end because ICSSR said now stop uh, otherwise we would have continued actually and this has given us a very interesting experience we are still not in a position to write on this it's, it's not possible perhaps we'll never never write on this um, but it, it, has, it, has, it has made us go through what we mean by a turn to subjectivity. And this is what we experienced. And I'll use a metaphor so as to include my younger friends over here to share with you what we went through as an experience of subjectivity as against the fear or the phobia around subjectivity. We saw we could not do it in terms of two, the natural science model. We saw we also could not do it in terms of what I put down as freedom, free will, mind, body, critical uh, reasoning, and a given uh, uh, subject or a created, produced subject. It, it could not happen uh, in this framework. Now, what could not happen in this framework? is what I want to touch now. And uh, this will be a journey uh, into uh, what I will call the uncanny. And this will, I, 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 I now have half an hour, so I'll just open up five, six, seven, and the half, finally, okay? And, and, and see where we go, where we go. And maybe we can take up some, uh, maybe we can go, uh, maybe we can, we can, go into that again in the afternoon, okay, where, where uh, now I'm rushing a little, so uh, I'll use a, use, a, use a metaphor to open this up, 
and it will take us actually uh, deep into something and I will name the something now. Think of, uh, because also I am speaking to researchers, I am setting up uh, a research framework also over here. Let us think of two fish in water. One is the, the fish that is narrating and the other is the fish that is listening. And this is the experience of subjectivity over here. Our usual framework is that the fish narrating would be in water and the fish listening would be on land and we would hear. This is also, also the framework of mental health. The psychiatrist sits on land and listens to the depressed in water and tries to pull her out of water, throwing in a rope, etc. etc. Which is where you get angry with doctors. The first turn to subjectivity was to come to water and see how we co occupy the listening fish and the narrating fish the same water and how we carry the odor of water, how the fish carries the odor of water. So the first step was to come to water and one can be happy with that. The second step was to see that the narrative fish is not alone. The narrative fish is in a colony of fish, family, school, peer groups, etc. And to understand the narrating fish, the listening fish had to very closely attend to not just the narrating fish's narrative, but to her relationship with intimate and significant others from infanthood. That became a big problem for us. And I asked my friends, who touched you naked first? Our minds go to adult relationships. But the first person who has touched us naked is perhaps our caregiver, our rearing parent. It is still woman, but men and women in future, hopefully. Uh, so, uh, we have been, our bodies have been touched and our bodies have been born with that first experience. So, there is something in us that predates adult experience. Adult experience may be an interesting knot of these KNOP, uh, of these infant experiences. So we could not get the experience of gendered violence only by getting the narratives in college, college going subjects. So the temporality of subjectivity had to be scrapped. So time had to be rethought. It is not the here and now but elsewhere, in another time in another joint, what then the falls in another joint in, in Spectres of Marx or in Hamlet actually, uh, some of you are from literature. So in Hamlet time is out of joint. Okay. So, so time was not what was occupied in the interview or in the interaction. So, so uh, a turn to subjectivity required a turn to time not inhabited by the present. Step one. Step two, it also required a turn to space not inhabited by the present. So our discussion rooms were filled with childhood spaces, fantasies, and all kinds of experiences, including dreams, which are very significant for a turn to subjectivity. 
and this is interpretation of dreams 1905. Okay. That, that Freud felt the necessity to turn to dreams as important and not as chaos or rubbish. Okay. And I'll, I'll end with that, I must. Uh, uh, how contemporary neurobiology is showing us dreams are very, very important and meaningful. They are actually giving us a different philosophical mind or today. It's, it's going to change psychology. It's, it's that path breaking a finding, actually. And it's interesting, it's showing human science people were right. In, a, in, a, in an intuitive way, they were right. And, and I'll end with that. I'll end with a little bit of uh, natural science. Uh, so in that sense, it opened up for us that we needed to, we needed to, be, we needed to be open to uh, the subject question in its ultimate robustness. Not just a simple relationship with subjectivity. So subjectivity meant a travel to another time and another space. The subject in the room was not the subject. The subject was elsewhere in another time. Next, we also saw that the subjects, the listening and the narrating subjects, shared a space and yet did not share a space. There was a significant and a fundamental contradiction. The narrating fish was in a different water, Kashmir, for example. And the listening fish had come from Bangalore. Yes, yes, rubbish. And, and, and did not know how to relate to the experience of the subject within extreme forms of violence that is occupying the subject's subject coordinates. So the subject's position, what Lacan called subject position, was different. The stick was bent differently. And one needed to attend to this query. So a good attention was required to the subject's prehistory, life history, psychohistory, cultural history, without which we could not attend to that subject. This opened up further questions for us. Our framework for attending to subjectivities was itself an impediment. We had been trained in stories born out of Oedipus, Sophocles, Oedipus Rex. And Totem and Taboo, Parasite, and Moses and Monotheism in Freud. I don't have the time to get into this, but how the subject constitution Framework is set up in psychoanalysis, marked by a Judaic and a Christian and a Hellenic framework. So the stories are from Sophocles. And the, and, the, and the movement is within that, and there is no clear explanation of how King Oedipus was Oedipal. Freud's assumption was that Oedipus was Oedipal. But what is the explanation for that? And we have glossed over it for 100 years, not really thinking, how is King Oedipus Oedipal? Oedipality and King Oedipus are two separate things altogether. How did we make this conceptual jump? Okay. And how is the father the Holy Father, the name of the Father, the Son of God, and the Holy Book, and circumcision, ritual circumcision in Moses and Monotheism. Am I rushing through this? Huh? Uh, uh, okay, we may take it up in the afternoon again. Huh? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm losing some of you. Uh, uh, how, how are these? Okay, if I give the counter example, it will open up. So, these are frameworks within which we were trying to understand. And I'm taking one, one phrase from uh, an unknown piece by Spivak called Psychoanalysis in the Left Field. Uh, left Field is baseball. Uh, uh, in baseball, the left field 
is very far from where the pitcher and the hitter is playing. So the left field is very far from uh, uh, the the main scene of or the scene of action or what we call the metropolitan uh, scene of action. And Spivak asks in this piece, how will psychoanalysis happen in the left field? What will happen to psychoanalysis when it's out in the left field? Uh, and, 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 and she shows that, uh, let me get into this a little bit, what is the problem uh, with even a turn to subjectivity? Our framework is an impediment. Okay. Uh, so, so the framework of Oedipality is an impediment to understanding subjectivity. And, and that is the only point I am trying to make. Forget Toto Bandabu, forget Mon Moses Monotheism, it doesn't matter. The, the very framework is not letting me listen. I am hearing. I am hearing what the subject is saying, but I am not listening. Okay. I am not listening because my framework is turning me dead. And, and this is one problem Spivak raises in this piece, and she says that what happens when psychoanalysis is out in the left field? Our usual framework in India, and this is the cultural turn I'm bringing now, uh, where I'm beginning to aboriginalize. Okay. And, and uh, uh, see, uh, the framework I set up was that uh, original frameworks, original frameworks of subjectivity, which are either no frameworks, okay, absence, or simple frameworks, freedom, free will, rationalism, empiricism, critical reason, mind. I have a mind. I have a psyche. Okay. So simple frameworks. Simple frameworks need to be aboriginalized. My second one, where I am putting under erasure okay, the original framework. Okay. So you are either rendering genealogical or archaeological and original, and original given to me, or you are putting under erasure the origin of origin. So you can do it either through Foucault or through Derrida. Okay, through Foucault you primarily historicize huh? with a critique of history. Interestingly, uh, with Derrida you primarily denaturalize. I'm keeping it simple. Okay, uh, so you you historicize, you denaturalize means what? You render the origin either genealogical within the history of ideas or you render the origin archaeological which are two methods in Foucault the two methodological detours in Foucault are genealogy and archaeology okay. so either you do a genealogy of ideas or an archaeology of knowledge so, so you either, either turn the origin which is what for a moment I tried to do with the two sex model men and women are the opposite sex you see the history of it, you see the birth of it, okay? And you try to see where is it coming from, and you open it up. And you, and you have a, so where is freedom coming from? Where is the human coming from? Where is the notion of free will coming from? Where is, I think, therefore I am coming from? Okay. So that is what you can examine, you can go back and examine. You can render it genealogical and archaeological, or you put under the nature the origin, you denaturalize which is what the constructive work is, that, that um, you, you find, uh, uh, it's not find in a, in a free will sense, uh, not in a free will sense, uh, you come to stumble upon uh, where the text uh, is open. Where, where, and, and I don't have the time to get into that, but uh, where the weave is not working, where the fabric, uh, uh, fabric, fabric the, the weave of the fabric is eroded. You can you can take a look at that. So so uh, for for research scholars, uh, these are methodologies actually, and, and uh, that could be uh, one way. I'm I'm turning now to the third, the Aboriginal, which which I'm calling culturalized. So so the suggestion I'm making is that to summarize, uh, we can turn to subjectivities, but we cannot turn uh, without historicization denaturalization and culturalization. And, and that is my last one in italics aboriginal, where I'm saying unabashedly aboriginalized. Don't be scared. Uh, 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 
and, and it's an interesting turn in research where, where this Vivakian question comes that your turn to subjectivity is getting hindered, halted by the framework of Edipanization and the story of the son who killed the father uh, uh, for the mother. Okay. That primal, that, 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 that story of primal parasite or the primal story of that primal parasite is determining your framework. What do you do? And she, this, this is exactly the phrase she uses. What do you do when you are put in a water of maternal polytheisms? Quote, maternal polytheisms. What do you do in a framework when you don't have a parasite story? Islam. And she critiques Freud in Moses and Monotheism for having seen Islam as a subset of the Judaic and the Christian. <coughs> and she says, my dear, where do you get the parasite story in Islam? It is not there. So why are you reducing it to a subset of Judaism and Christianity? And, and our usual understanding, three Semitic religions, okay, and they are all together, okay, is what is opened up by her and maternal polytheism. It's a complicated argument, but I'm giving it to you in a nutshell, actually. But this is what is her framing with respect to the psychoanalysis in the left field, out in the left field. And she's saying, in the, the, what does the left field fielder do? He catches. I'm not even saying she here. He catches. Okay. And, and she is saying that how would we do psychoanalysis? Or, and my question is, how would we return to subjectivity? Would we catch what the pictures and the hitters would send to us from the metropolis? Or would we reimagine our framework to turn to subjectivity? Aboriginalized, unabashedly, huh? not to be too scared. Uh, and turn to how we can relate to subjectivities in terms of two problems that she raises, maternal polytheisms, the context, the water of maternal polytheisms, and Islam that doesn't have a parasite story. So in that sense, two points are raised by her over there. And, and, and uh, this then raises a problem for us that what is the framework? Our framework is itself making us turn away from subjectivity. Turn away from this. The next problem. The next problem, I have to suggest metaphorically as a turn to subjectivity. Think of this as not a lake or a pond. It's the Pacific. The water is so deep. And it actually happens. Light doesn't travel to the floor of the Pacific. Light gets cut off some. Now, what would happen if light doesn't travel to the floor of the Pacific? It would be dark, but that's obvious. Uh, and depth is not dark. Only the unconscious is not dark. Uh, and it's not an it also. It's not a thing. It's a perspective. As light will get cut off, what will happen is that photosynthesis will not happen. And leaves will not be green anymore. So leaves are not green. Leaves are green only when there is sunlight and photosynthesis and chlorophyll. This qualifier doesn't come in school. Light doesn't travel in straight line. We don't know whether it is wave or particle. We don't say all these. Life ends under certain conditions. Okay. So in that sense, we will reach a floor of the Pacific as we work through subjectivities. And it actually happened as our narratives got deepened. We moved beyond 30, 20 different for different people. As we went deeper and deeper, we found that light has got cut off. We are not in familiar terrain. It's becoming more and more uncanny. This is not the subject I know. 
So it's pointless to give the Aadhaar card as the identity of the subject, which is why security never works. Because to the airport, security channel, what gets through, are not what is recorded in passports or ID cards or voter IDs or in the uh, Aadhaar card, something else goes through. Uh, and uh, that subject uh, is, is a subject that is a challenge how to relate to that subject. And, and that subject cannot be reduced to simple notions of life and death. As we go deep, as light gets cut off, what we find is that leaves are orange, violet, pink, and blue. Leaves are not green. And the character of the fish changes. Metaphorically put, and I can only suggest it metaphorically, otherwise I'll have to read a case history, then you can see it also, and I'll come to that now. Um, metaphorically put, the fish, which was, say what, uh, some, uh, uh, and they looked quite similar at the surface. One fish perhaps becomes a starfish as we go down, and the other one becomes an octopus. So as we go deeper and the turn to subjectivity happens, you begin at the surface with two, but you end up in a relation between an octopus and a starfish. I think the metaphor has gone across that. that it's, a, it's a different subject you are dealing with as you are going deeper and deeper. And this becomes, uh, in, a, in an interesting way, the turn to subjectivity, a turn that cannot be simply a turn to the transparent, obvious, on the surface, or at the surface. Uh, uh, a turn to something that escapes, eludes, makes us think. And, and this then becomes uh, this then becomes the problem uh, that one needs to deal with when one is turning to subjectivity. Even in our turn to subjectivity, we may lack this dimension. We may lack an attention to the starfish and the octopus. And you, you may now see why Freud names all his case histories in a completely bizarre way. One is called the wolf man, the other is called the rat man, and the third is called the horse man, the little hands case. Why does he use zoological or botanical metaphors to express the story of the subject? Because the subject, and this is where we are the animal that therefore I am, which is like I shared that reading, that, that this is where we are not simply you. A turn to subjectivity will require a turn to a critical anti-humanism, which is why Foucault, and there is a both become very important, and there is nearly uh, one of the last works, the animal that therefore I am, is important. It's important uh, because, because um, uh, this, is, uh, this is an important uh, dimension. We need to take care of the zoological and the botanical in us and that it's not simple the way we have understood ourselves. You know, you know that, that this is where I, I want to end, end, end with a few more signposts. It's, it's what, what we have had as, as, as subjectivity. First, we haven't had it, number one. Number two, when we have had it, it has been a somewhat impoverished dish. Okay. It requires a lot of starters and desert. Okay. And, and eat well, which is where uh, uh, the uh, eat, eating, eating well comes, but an eating that is not catabolic. And, and that requires the, the, the uh, uh, difficult uh, line over here. And eating that is not cannibalistic, and, and, and eating that requires reading. 
And in terms of this, what has happened, I'll now just enumerate, I'll take five more minutes. Huh? Uh, uh, I'll just enumerate now, one, two, three, four, five, what happens when you, when you take this turn to subjectivity that is not the usual. One, there is every possibility a turn to subjectivity will be a turn to metaphysics. And this is what Heidegger calls subjectivity in Western philosophy is an epoch of the metaphysics of subjectivity. It critiques the turn to subjectivity. See how, how strange it is. We need a turn to subjectivity and the turn to subjectivity is being critiqued. Or a psychic or mentalistic metaphysics. Or a metaphysics of agency. Three possibilities. Quickly put. Three possibilities, okay, identitarian, psychic, mentalistic, having some inner mind interiority in us, or agential, or rational, which is why Foucault had to write history of madness. Now understanding the predicate framework of subjectivity is rational subjectivity. Transparent, obvious, given to us, can be understood. So you have a framework of a little I within. Just see the last line, uh, you can't see. <laughs> it's called the homunculus fallacy, that there is a little I within me. So there is, that, that Anup can look at Anup. So there is an Anup within Anup, and an Anup within Anup's Anup, and an Anup within Anup's Anup's Anup. So, uh, it, it, we will, it, to make the framework of subjectivity amenable to a framework of I, I, I in caps lock, you will actually fall into a kind of a little I within you. You always have to imagine, oh, there is another Anu within Anu who is reflecting. Uh, and and, and it, it has gone into other kinds of debates. I'll take it up in the afternoon. Intentionality, qualia, what are these? What are these? And, and the usual framework within, within Husserl, how we try to understand subjectivity in terms of uh, intentionality or quality. I'll, I'll come to that uh, later. Uh, so where we move towards is to deconstruct the idea of subjectivity as self-presence. There is something. Uh, so in the presencing, let me put it this way, the presencing of subjectivity happens through a philosophy of presence. So there is a presence, there is a, there is a, a philosophy or a metaphysics of presence at work when you present subjectivity, otherwise you absent it. And, and, and that's a problem. Uh, I'll come to this in the afternoon. The question of the now, uh, the time-space curvature in subjectivity uh, discussions, which is very, very important. Um, leave this, leave this, uh, I've done this. Mm. Um, maybe I'll do this in the afternoon. How to see subjectivity through the metaphor of writing. Okay, I'll, I'll do it in the afternoon. Not uh, that one way out could be, could be, and that is a suggestion I'm making. Maybe I can take questions on this. And I invoke Freud's uh, very short piece, four page piece written in 1924-25, called the mystic writing pad, which gives us a completely different framework of the mind, where the mind is seen as a writing apparatus, not a thing inside us. Okay, so the mind is seen as a writing apparatus, and, and we, will, we will look at that uh, in the afternoon. Uh, we'll, we'll closely read the mystic writing pad piece of Freud, and see, uh, how the mind, the clue is this, is a two-handed machine, uh, is, is a machine, uh, and I'm using machine, okay. uh, that, that, that writes in a very interesting way, uh, that, that, that writes and erases, uh, so uh, the mind, uh, and, and this could be one understanding of subjectivity, which is why we require that whole turn to the uh, bottom of the Pacific and all that, because the, because the because the the subjective was getting written in, in very interesting ways. It's 
it's writing erasure retention. The triad is this, uh, like simply put, you can write on the whiteboard and erase and write again. Okay, so that's one kind of writing that, that the subjective goes through. We write, we erase, we rewrite. So there is writing and erasure and rewriting. The other is writing and retention. So if you write on a, on a piece of paper, you retain. You cannot easily erase, you cannot rewrite. You can overwrite. Okay. So, so uh, how, how, how does the subject work is, is an important question. And that is a problem we can take up in the afternoon. And, and Freud's suggestion that the mind or the human subject is writing erasure, retention, rewriting, overwriting, and to turn to subjectivity, the suggestion is just this, you have to take into consideration all this. Otherwise, you are only looking at the surface script. What is written on the surface and, and what is available to you now. You are not looking at the palimpsestic. You are not, not seeing what is provisionally unseen seen. What is presence, absence or absence presence. That, and that, that is one important point. Um, so, so see, these are the two frameworks. On the one hand, we have a scientism uh, marked by an obsession uh, for objectivity, empiricism, quantitative measures, mechanical materialism in Marx, uh, and laboratory experiments. On the other hand, and this is something I'll take up in the afternoon, what I'm calling stereotypical spiritualisms okay. or identitarianisms. Okay, when we turn to subjectivity, but we turn to certain stereotypical spiritualisms and, and don't examine what is the spiritual through Foucault's text, hermeneutics of the subject, and a turn to Tagore, we will read the spiritual differently. Can there be another understanding of the spiritual? Not the one that has been given to us hitherto by what I would call, and I'm risking it, brown orientalism. The orientalism of the brown, not of the white. So how we have been given a stereotypical spiritualism, a stereotypical understanding of Indian religion or Indian religions. Okay. So we will, we will look at that in the afternoon. Um, this again I'll take up in the afternoon. Should I end? Yes, right? Um, take, this I can take up in the afternoon. Uh, wait. Let me just. <coughs> let me end with two quotes. Two quotes from two Aboriginal philosophers. And I'm leaving you with this problem. Okay, I'm not going to solve the problem. We have had a discussion that is of a certain kind. Certain thinkers, certain frameworks. Certain frameworks have been put to critique also. So I have critiqued psychoanalysis in my turn to psychoanalysis. Okay. Uh, and we have talked of the left field, out in the left field. Out in the left field, we encounter two thinkers, and I'll leave you with this. I'll do the themes in the afternoon. What is, what is it to turn to dreams, but we have got a sense of it, the dream now, that, that, that the dream becomes an important repository of subjectivity. Okay? Uh, uh, it, is, it is not trash, it is actually very, very important, because it is giving us a glimpse of the bed of the Pacific, of the starfish and of the bus of the orange, violet, and pink leaves. Pink leaves, leaflets of our lives. The pink manuscripts of our lives. Okay. So, so the dreams offer us a glimpse of that. And, and, and we'll see that. We'll see that in the afternoon. I'll end with two people who were turning to subjectivity and perhaps falling on their face. I'm not defending these two people. But I'm only suggesting, on the one hand, while we have Baconian science, Kantian positivism, and all the British education coming to our universities, 
these two people, one set up an ashram, the other set up an university, called it an ashram. Huh? So, uh, uh, maybe non-stereotypical spiritualisms, these two are. I'm ending with these two aboriginal thinkers who are also trying to turn to subjectivity and are, and are unsure what is happening over there. And let us have a critical take on this in the afternoon. Okay? I'm not defending them. Please, please. Okay? One is Tagore, the other is Gandhi. And why am I doing this? Let me tell you. Marx starts Capital Volume 1 clearly stating, I'm going to look at commodities. Okay. And there is a footnote in Capital Volume 1. It's footnote 1. In footnote 1, he says, I'm not going to look at needs, desires, and wants. I'm only going to look at objects. Okay. And that footnote that, has, that was left behind and that has cost official Marxism quite a lot. Huh? Uh, the Marxist dream became a nightmare, uh, is my proposition. Because of that footnote that was left behind in, 19, uh, in 1860s, uh, uh, okay? it really made the dream a nightmare in the Soviet and now in China. Uh, it's perhaps because there was lack of attention to that footnote, to that remainder, uh, which serves a nasty reminder to us that we needed to take commodities and desires in their intimate implications. And not just one. Teo writes in one of his letters to somebody, there was a time when in the inner world of my mind, I had time and space for meditation. A path had inadvertently got created by my repeated turning away from the hustle and bustle of familial, familiar life and my equally repeated excursions into the inner world. So he makes a bizarre distinction that he has a mind and he has an inner world. Okay. This is a very strange formulation. We would think the mind and inner world are the same, but he makes a distinction. Just like a walkway gets created in the jungle by the daily excursions of wood gatherers along a beaten track, now I can't find that path. So here is one understanding of subjectivity, where he says, where he understands subjectivity not as presence, not as a highway, not as a six-lane highway, but as a walkway that he created or what created um, mm, a, a pathway uh, into the inner world. So, could that be uh, one understanding? I am taking this from Gandhi's Bhagavad Gita, where um, he opposed existing readings of Bhagavad Gita in India. All the ones. He is opposing the existing readings of Bhagavad Gita and is saying you are reading it wrong. Here could be one view. The chief aim of the epic is to represent the most invisible of all invisible worlds. The moral problems which confront one in this inner world are far more difficult than those of a physical world. The real Kurukshetra is the human heart which is also, skip the four lines, which is also a dharma shetra, the field of righteousness. Some battle or other is fought on this battlefield from day to day. Most of these battles arise from the distinction between mine and thine, between kinsmen and strangers, attraction and repulsion lie at the root of sin. And, and he goes on, and we need not read any more. So he reads the Kurukshetra as a, as a completely different metaphor, uh, uh, metaphor uh, of, of a kind of uh, uh, raging, raging battle uh, that, that goes on. And uh, turn to subjectivity is a turn to this Kurukshetra, which inhabits all of us. Turn to politics is a turn, I'm redefining politics, 
non-coercive reorganization of faces and facets <coughs> within the food shelter. So it's it's one way of of relating uh, uh, philosophical and the political, which is what I began with, the two understandings of subjectivity. Uh, and uh, one one way would be uh, to look at to look at the the turn to the subjective as a turn uh, to the Kurukshetra or to the bottom of the Pacific, and a work on subjectivity, which is for me the definition of politics. Politics has been usually defined as the distinction between mine and thine, <coughs> friend and in which is what Carl Schmitt shows in the concept of the political that uh, or there is a politics of friendship that the politics, the understanding of politics is the distinction, is always marked by the distinction between friend and enemy. Uh, what is it to understand politics turned to the subjective? Because friend and enemy is identitarian. Uh, politics turned to the subjective which is a turn to uh, this uncanny raging battle in us in which we ourselves are complicit. The distinction between friend and enemy is not given, it's not simple, we cannot take it as given. It's a non-coercive reorganization of desire or of the raging battle or of the subjective and, and that gives to politics a completely different term, a completely different imagination and, 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 and the subjective, the philosophical the political come to get related in a completely different way, far removed perhaps from the metaphysical.